Okay, hello everybody Happy having and welcome to this segment of the Bitcoin magazine um, having live stream. My name is John Quigley. I am the head of research for crypto mining publication minerupdate.com and I'm very excited today because I'm here with three gentlemen who have a deep deep knowledge of the crypto mining industry. And today we're going to be talking about the impact that having is going to be having on large mining farms. And we're also going to be talking about the impact the having will have on hardware. But before we do that, we're going to get introductions from these three gentlemen. So without further ado, let's kick it off and let's start with yourself, Mr. Adam Friedman. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good evening here from Tokyo. Uh, I am the CEO of SVI Mining Chip, which is SVI, the large Japanese investment bank's foray into the design and manufacturing of advanced mining hardware. Uh, in addition to that, I also happen to be the CEO of SVI and Ripple's joint venture called SVI Ripple Asia, and also co-founded and the uh, CEO of a company called BRD, which is responsible for the Bread Wallet app that uh, many of you hopefully have heard about over the last many years. Uh, by virtue of uh, sort of my past, I was originally an electrical engineer and computer chip designer based in Silicon Valley and uh, have turned serial entrepreneur, been the founding CEO of several companies, raised a couple hundred million dollars and uh, built great products and teams and exited those companies. I got into crypto about five years ago. Uh, I was very skeptical at first and then realized that uh, since banking and lending are the largest opportunities in the world, that um, those investors who are pouring money into the industry weren't as crazy as I initially thought. And uh, perhaps today I am as much of an evangelist as everyone else. So happy to be here and look forward to the discussion. Okay, sounds great. How about you, Ian? Good evening, everybody. My name is Ian Chapek, uh, and I'm a co-founder and co-CEO of a company called Brains. Uh, we are the company who's been running, operating and developing Slush Pool for the past seven years. So that's about the time when I got into Bitcoin. It was back in 2013. Uh, besides uh, the Slush Pool project, we are also known for having an open source mining firmware called BrainsOS, uh, where we try to provide an alternative to the factory firmwares of the mining devices. Um, so that's pretty much uh, what we do. Great, Igor. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Igor Runets. I am co I am a founder and CEO of uh, Bitriver Mining, so the largest mining data center in Russia and CIS region. Um, I got into crypto in 2015 from traditional data centers and telecommunications uh, space, and. Uh, now, beyond uh, just uh, Bitmay, uh, Bitriver mi Mining, we also uh, operate the energy company called Faraday Energy Company. So, Bitriver Mining Data Centers and Faraday Energy Company. Okay, it looks like we have a very decentralized panel with um, yeah, professionals in Russia, Europe, and also Japan. Um, for the first question I was wanting to put out there, it's, it's an open question, so anybody can feel free to jump in and, and add their angles. Um, all of you have experience with big mining farms and big mining operations. Over the past six to 12 months, how have these operations been preparing for the halving? I would say that from our perspective, and we are not only a manufacturer of miners, uh, but we're also a large customer purchasing miners uh, that we develop internally, as well as those uh, on the open market. And I would say that up to the happening, as you probably saw during the previous happening, you see an expansion of operations. People want to take advantage of uh, the low electricity rates that they've negotiated in order to mine as much as possible with the best hardware in class before the happening happens. Uh, post happening, we expect that um, you know a lot of miners will be basically gutted from the market because the electricity prices and the farms won't be able to support profitability post happening. Uh, however, you know those that were at scale prior 
who were able to secure great uh, electricity prices previously will uh, will continue and will continue well. So I expect that um, you know the first half of this year is a, a great couple of quarters for uh, Bitcoin manufacturing and hardware companies like us. Okay. Um, and in terms of upgrading equipment prior to the halving, there was a lot of a talk about um, big mining farms having to upgrade to the latest gen to increase their chances of surviving going past the halving. But have any of you experienced or believe that some mining farms that are lowest on the cost curve and are extremely efficient may be waiting till after the halving and seeing some miners go bankrupt and trying to pick up their mining rigs at a lower price? Uh, that could be certainly the case. Uh, the question is if we're going to see the same kind of craziness that happened, for example, back in 2017, if there is going to be any significant uh, price action. Uh, I did some calculations before uh, before our panel, and actually I do publish those quite regularly on Twitter, on my Unbrains uh, uh, account. Uh, where I try to use the uh, efficiency of a miner compared to the current difficulty and you plug in your electricity price. And actually one of my colleagues turned it into a nice Tableau app where you can play with the parameters. And it turns out at the current difficulty levels, uh, the margin for, for miners who are uh, using their, S, for example, S9s at like 86 joules per terahash, which is an average setting. You could probably go a little bit lower than this on the efficiency level. Uh, they are uh, having uh, a margin of like 50 percent. So that means at this price level of Bitcoin, this margin would be wiped out on Monday. But so, so I am assuming that a lot of farms are kind of like waiting what's going to happen after this point in time. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they are getting ready for replacing the equipment, but they they still see something like six or eight weeks of uh, being operational if their electricity costs, according to my calculations, are around like four or three point five cents, which uh, I'm assuming that the big miners should be in this range, including the operational cost. Hey, Jan, it's Adam. Uh, I agree with you. I think that, you know, for for the sort of large scale miners who are operating with older equipment like S9s or perhaps a generation after like an S9 Pro, uh, somewhere around that electricity price, uh, they're gonna be taken off the market. But uh, so to, to answer the original question, I think actually people tend to upgrade after the happening, not before. And the reason is they wanna milk every dollar they can get from their existing hardware. Hopefully they've placed orders though beforehand because there's a, a lead time on getting the hardware out. And right now TSMC is way over capacity. Um, and so, you know, even though with coronavirus and everything and a, and a uh, reduction in, say, iPhone and iPad, you know, orders and Huawei having issues as well, still the orders for wafers that are being produced now were placed six months ago before Corona or three to six months ago. And so you're going to see you're going to continue to see a, um, a lack of supply. And so I hope those folks got the, those orders in. Nevertheless, what I would say is this, while even after the halvening, when those folks who are um, operating and who are, um, you know, barely flirting with profitability or break even, I should say, or just a little below. There's a human psychology aspect to it as well. People don't like to be wrong. They want to think the price is going to go up. So sometimes they keep operating those miners. So for example, what you see is that the network hash rate will, pro will definitely go down after the happening, but it'll, it'll go down over time, right? And then as people get new miners to replace those old ones that they turn off, right? Then you expect it to come back up. And there's always this sort of nice uh, ratio between the um, Bitcoin price and the total network caching power. And we expect that to continue to, you know, to, to show the same type of correlation um, because it, it sort of has to for, for the economics to work. But what we're going to see after the halvening is that those people with the capital to buy the most power efficient miners and those people with the lowest electricity prices, they're going to be the last ones standing. And, and that's what it takes to win in the operator space. We saw slightly different dynamic in our data center. Almost all our large clients sold off all the generation machines by the end of last year. 
as they sold to retail uh, miners in Russia. It's kind of inter interesting dynamic in Russia. For retail uh, consumers, electricity price is very low. In some regions, like around one uh, US dollar cent. And like all our large clients, we have clients from uh, many regions, like uh, Japan, China, uh, United States, Europe. And uh, almost all of them uh, were able to kind of uh, sell a significant portion of their older generation machines by the end of last year and were kind of installing a lot of new generation machines. Uh, so like slightly different dynamic in our case. You have smart customers, Igor, <laughs> those that got in early and placed their orders early. That makes the most sense. I definitely want to come back, Igor, to some of the attractive elements of mining in Russia. But I want to touch a bit more on the S9. There was some research recently by an analyst of Climetrics, Karim Helmi, and it estimated that the current network hash rate is represented by 23% is represented by Antminer S9s. How is this going to look in the months after having? Will the Antminer S9 become obsolete, or will we still see it represent a significant share? They, they have to become obsolete because even if you still have them and your electricity price is low enough such that you can operate them barely profitably, you're doing that at an opportunity cost of making a significant more amount of revenue if you upgrade those machines. So the trick is this. Can you or do you can you find or do you have the capital to replace them? And the industry has been built on this notion that you have to pay ahead of time for the miners up front. And that really precludes people going and, 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 and basically replacing things en masse, right? And that's why you've seen some mining companies, as you said before, either they fail or they get bought up for pennies on the dollar after halvenings. Um, and, and companies like ours, uh, since we're a bank, you know, we offer financing for miners, very much like you might get financing when you buy a, a car. And you know, that financing with installment payments affords companies the ability to use the asset to actually pay back the, the, the cost of the asset. And while the interest rates aren't, you know, aren't as low as what you'd get uh, for a car loan, for example, you know, they still make a lot of sense in the mining space. So I, I, I think they're gonna be gone pretty soon. They have to be those S9. Okay, and go ahead, Igor. Yeah, I would agree with that. It uh, really depends on availability of uh, capital for miners. Obviously, uh, some miners who bought machines and didn't return the capital, uh, they, will, uh, they would keep running the S9s for as long as possible. Uh, but like all the miners, like uh, larger professional, uh, my, more professional miners who were able to replace uh, the machines as they, as, as they already did this or will do uh, right after halving. So I agree with this. Okay, Jan, do you also agree that we'll see an upgrade from, from all miners who can stay in the business? Well, uh, uh, maybe I didn't express myself uh, precisely, but this is what we are hearing from the big farms. They're essentially getting ready for uh, replacement of the hardware. So they usually place their orders already uh, and they're just waiting for the shipments. And once these miners are installed, I mean, then what, what could happen? You would either have a rise in difficulty that would obsolete the, the old hardware even faster, or if it stays constant, uh, that means that the farms that did have too high, uh, you know, electricity costs and operational costs uh, that could not operate as nice, would just go out of business. Mm. Hey, actually, okay. Thomas, do you mind if I, I answered a question into Igor and Jan, if you don't mind? I'm really curious because I, I think they're right that a lot of people have placed orders. I'm curious what everybody thinks about the recent instability at Bitmain and their ability to fulfill the orders that uh, people have placed over the last several months. I assume everyone saw that there was a fight at the bureau in Beijing the other day, uh, which was caught on Twitter, and uh, the business license was uh, for a short period of time stolen by, uh, amazingly, the chief legal officer for Bitmain, and then uh, he was thrown in jail by the police. So I'm very curious uh, what Jan and Igor think about uh, their capability of delivering on their contracts. It's a, it's well, a great question. And we saw like a lot of uh, hesitation from many of our large cl uh, clients to place orders with a Bitmain even, even before this. 
uh, we definitely see kind of uh, Bitmain share uh, significantly decreasing recently. I cannot speak to like specific uh, things because we are not like directly connected to the mining hardware. But from what we are hearing from the miners, they try to diversify any potential risk. So they usually, oh, that that's at least what they say. Uh, they try to diversify their orders between what's miner and uh, Bitcoin and see what comes first. Pretty much, um, what. We also heard is that it is not quite sure, like if the, for example, the S nines are going to be delivered on time and uh, in enough quantity required by the customers. So the mass production could be delayed because of all the coronavirus things and stuff like that. So maybe maybe Adam could could have any input on this as well. Jan, you said S nine. Do you mean S nineteen? Uh, sorry, sorry, I meant I meant S nineteen. Ah, yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I, I have a lot of visibility into that. Actually, I think the the ODMs in China uh, were not terribly delayed. I mean, in our case, for example, you know, a couple of weeks time, nothing significant. TSMC uh, basically made up for for all issues, and there are not significant delays there at all. So we we haven't really seen any any issues out of uh, wafer um, or chip manufacturing. Um, that said. I think that uh, because of the the slowdown, just in general consumer purchasing of uh, electronics, uh, you're going to see kind of a uh, you still see overcapacity at TSMC now, but in Q3, Q4, you're going to see that come down a little bit because right now the orders have been reduced because of Corona in Q2, right? And so that manifests itself in Q3 and Q4 at the chip manufacturing level and the ODM level. And then it'll come back with a vengeance at, right at the end of the year. So we're gonna continue to see a, a difficult lack of supply. I think right now with all the old hardware in the mining space um, slated for replacement, I guess Igor's customers are smart. They, they placed their orders late last year. Not everybody is as smart as them. A lot of folks are doing that uh, now or post-Halvening. A lot of folks are hesitant because um, if you saw Canon's public uh, publicly reported um, results uh, to the NASDAQ uh, after they went public uh, just a, couple, a few weeks ago. Um, they are projecting some, some pretty scary numbers going into the next quarter. Uh, Bitmain's, you know, uh, obviously having a lot of legal trouble and um, uh, hope for all the best with the Watts Miner guys. But you know, I think we all know that there's some legal issues there as well. So there, there's a lot of instability in the industry right now. And that makes it really difficult for large mining companies to just send tens of millions of dollars to these folks, um, you know, and, and, and hope for the best. So it's going to be really interesting uh, to see what happens. Uh, it's, it's, I, I'm thankful for it. it. It resulted in us selling out of our first generation systems way earlier than we expected uh, due to the instability with the other players. Um, but I think that if you look back at the history of like computers and microprocessors, where Intel became the monopoly after competing with like AMD and Cyrix and all that in the 80s and 90s, I, I actually think we're going to see the same thing in the mining space. I think we're going to see the same sort of trend. I think there's going to be one player in the major chip area, and then there'll be a lot of system companies uh, or a few system companies, just like you can buy computers from Dell and, and many other companies today. So I, uh, I think it's just going to get too costly. I think the cash flow situation and the margins are too low for too many companies to try to all make their own chips. So we'll, we'll see if, um, if that comes true or not. When do you think we'll arrive at that kind of a system where we have one dominant player? Yeah, in order, I mean, think about how long it was before Intel finally killed AMD and Cyrix. It took like a freaking decade, man. But I, I think in this case, it's got to go quicker. You know why? Because these other companies are just not that financially strong. And, and look at the like crazy levels of governance, instability, and police action, right? <laughs> these companies, I mean, it, it rivals like a movie. Somebody's got to make a movie about this, by the way. They totally should. So I would say it's going to be a lot faster. I would say definitely within two to three years. For sure, it's like a like a Hollywood movie. Um, MicroBT seems to be putting a lot of pressure on the Bitmain market share, um, and I see that they're getting support of some companies. Do you think by the twenty twenty four having we might have a new leader in the market? Well, I hope that leader is me. <laughs> but, uh, I, I have a lot of respect for uh, Dr. Um, Young at MicroBT as well. 
And uh, I think they're doing a great job. And, you know, we work with them as well. So, um, you know, we actually work with the guys. We work with Jahan. We work with uh, NG at Canaan, too. So we're really at SVI. We're very much into competition, right? Like we love to create competing situations because we think that competition breeds great products and grows industries. So, you know, it's a very, very small world that we all live in. Um, but I, I, I very much hope that uh, we can bring some legitimacy and um, you know, sort of stability to the industry because I'll be damned, we haven't really seen it thus far, have we? Interesting. Igor, I wanted to bring it back to you because I know BitRiver have operations both in China and in Russia. Um, can you touch on some of the differences mining in these two regions? So first of all, I will correct this a little bit. So we mined both in Russia and in China. Uh, currently, all our collocation data center facilities are located in Russia, not in China. But we have a lot of experience both with Russia and China. Uh, so, um, so some pros and cons of uh, each of those countries. So Russia. Why we decided to go with Russia for our data center business? It's a lot of cheap, sustainable, excessive capacity. So there are a lot of huge hydropower plants were built in Siberia during like 60s or 70s. And now we have access to a lot of sustainable green hydropower capacity in this region. And this is definitely a pros. And Actually, kind of unique um, feature of uh, that hydropower in Siberia is uh, that it's stable. We don't have uh, huge fluctuations between a uh, summer season, a uh, winter season. So uh, the water stream in Siberia is uh, very stable and um, there is no huge uh, fluctuations. So sustainability, stability, uh, and expensive uh, power is kind of... Um, good feature of Siberia. Another feature is uh, called climate. We save a lot of money on the cooling of the devices. And after that, um, very supportive and uh, predictable uh, regulatory situation with uh, federal government, with local government. I, I believe those are three main pros of money in Russia. Money in China is kind of slightly different. Uh, people are kind of more focused on a short a term return, um, not on the long term stability. That's why we see kind of people acting uh, very opportunistically, moving devices from, for example, Sichuan to other places and moving back to Sichuan for summer. It's kind of a very unique uh, characteristic, uh, very unique feature of money in uh, China. But a very big advantage of mining in China is kind of proximity to all the manufacturers, proximity to supply chain. Uh, sometimes people have been able to build mines and uh, deliver devices to those mines much faster in China, significantly okay. faster in China. So uh, there are some pros and cons. I believe uh, for us as a who focused on kind of long-term stability and predictability. Russia is a little bit more attractive for data center play uh, because we have access to very predictable, low-cost, sustainable electricity, uh, good predictable re re regulation. And um, our clients are ready to wait for like extra week or so for their devices being delivered. Okay, seems like, yeah, seems like Russia is, has a lot of attractive points as a mining region. And it will be interesting to see how the hash rate share changes over the next four years. Well, we're, uh, we're going to wrap up soon. Sorry? We're working on this uh, to change uh, the distribution of hash power. Yeah, let's see. Let's see how it shapes up. Um, before we wrap up, another um, big thing in mining apart from getting low electric rates and good capital deals um, is obviously the firmware you use to run the device and how you can boost your hash rate capacity, increase the efficiency of your hardware. And Jan, Brains have been doing some extraordinary work in this area. Do you believe this is going to be a huge uh, angle for miners to stay competitive going forward using firmware on the latest generations of hardware? 
Uh, well, what we're seeing is that there is uh, a lot of uh, firmware projects that uh, have come to the market that try to optimize the settings of individual mining chips on the, you know, inside of the machine. And this is also the path that we also took with Brains OS, where we still do have the open source community edition. And then we have a Brains OS Plus that we uh, have a, as a commercial product that does all these tuning algorithms currently supporting DS9s and we're bringing DS17 support. But actually there is another interesting aspect uh, that we sort of like, we didn't anticipate that this could happen, but um, there were a few people that kind of pointed that uh, we have quite a few firmwares available for, for different machines in the market, but they all built on top of CG Miner. And since they uh, and, like extend the functionality, uh, they seem to be like breaking the GPL licensing because uh, they don't give the users the IP behind you know the tuning even though it's part of CG Miner code base, which is GPL. So technically, they uh, any customer that takes the firmware should should uh, receive a copy of, of the sources and so on. And this goes down also to the manufacturers who build their products on top of open source uh, software components, not just speaking of CG Miner, but we have uh, we have uh, you know Linux kernel, the, the Linux distribution, all these things, and they keep all that stuff closed. Uh, so there may be some some shift in this area, uh, and we try to provide solution for this because that's that's what Brains OS is about. Yeah, I know there's been a lot of um, a lot of debate Noise. and a lot of stuff <laughs> going on in the firmware uh, industry recently. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have time for that, and it'll have to be a discussion for another day. Um, so we're going to wrap up. Thank you, gentlemen. You're all doing an amazing job in the mining industry, and happy having to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. the opportunity, Christian. Take care. Uh, talk to you later, Jan and Igor. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Bye.